right. Hey, everybody. Welcome in to episode two of uh, the Pharmacist and the Photog uh, Games, Groups, and Grub podcast. Uh, I am the pharmacist, Dion Spencer, and this is my cohort here, Steve Moss, the Photog. What's shaking, bacon? Not much. We're going to try to be somewhat attentive to what we're doing here tonight. We've got the the uh, first UK exhibition game plan kind of off screen here. Uh, so if we get a little distracted, uh, that might be the reason, but hopefully we're going to do a little better uh, staying on track. So the Mark Pope era begins tonight. That's right. Against Kentucky Wesleyan. Yeah, they're looking like the world champions right now. That's what, that's what we're thinking. So, uh, but they are playing, I think it's the YMCA or something like that, but, but <laughs> they're playing well. So they look good. They're moving the ball. Around. 60 points at half. So, uh, so what difference. we're going to do here, we talked about a little bit last week. We're going to talk about the three things that we like a lot, uh, sports, music, and food and beverage, and, and then basically whatever else we decide to talk about. A little pop culture. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll hit a little bit of everything, whatever strikes our fancy, but we're going to jump right in with, uh, we're going to talk about the debacle that was the UK-Florida game. And, and coming off of the the loss to Vandy, um, you, you thought, well, Kentucky in bounce back games, Mark Stoops has, has done very well. His teams have, have always come back and, and played uh good solid football and it wasn't the case at florida um not sure what's going on i think a lot of fans are questioning the play calling um florida goes into the game with a true freshman quarterback uh, a true freshman running back which is the first time in their school's history that that's ever happened in a game where they've started a true freshman at quarterback and running back and and those two guys just literally put Florida on its back on their backs and you know 48 points zero touchdowns passing but uh the running back um five touchdown carries which is a school record Jordan Bow or Baugh um with five touchdowns just just an impressive showing how much of that was Florida and how much of that was was Kentucky's you know, lack of defense, I'm not sure. Right. I mean, and you can look at the quarterback, the kid completed seven passes, but when seven of the, or five of those seven yards. passes go for 200, or they were five of those seven passes were over 40 yards. Yeah. And, and, and Kentucky gave up the big play all night long. Um, I went back and counted. Um, I'm trying to, to look here at my notes, but I think it was something like uh, 14 or 15 plays of 11 plus yards and i think there were four or five plays of 20 plus yards so uh, a lot of concern there in the secondary they gave up a lot of long passes over the top um and just once again kentucky's offense just really didn't fire don't know you know um again if it was offensive line issues uh, i know there were a couple times where um, you know, they, they didn't have the right guys in Mark Stoops on Monday saying that, uh, it was a groupings issue. There was one third and 11 in the fourth quarter, uh, that Kentucky needed to convert to stay in the game, or at least, you know, try to, try to make a game of it. And, and they didn't have Barry on Brown in there and they didn't have Dane key in there. And, and, uh, Brock Vandergrift, uh, Vandergrift you know, trying to make a long throw on an out route. And that's just, you know, that's too long a throw for a guy like that. And he's trying to throw it to Brown Stevens. And, um, you know, people are questioning the play calling. Um, Bush uh, talked to the media yesterday, um, Bush Hamden, the the offensive coordinator, and and he said, it's a process. We've got to stick with it. So, you know, uh, we've got some sound that we're going to hear from Mark Stoops here in a minute about the play calling and fans being upset with the play calling, but, um, you know, just not being able to get the tough yardage when they need it. Uh, once again, like with, uh, with the game against Vanderbilt, they, they were in a, um, fourth and goal situation at the two couldn't punch it in, uh, just can't get that short yardage when they need it. Right. And, and again, we, we've seen the offense struggle, obviously, up to this point but we kind of felt like we've got the one of the top 
four or five defenses in the country in our back pocket, well, then they don't produce the kind of effort or, or game that we, we were expecting. So um, that – Yeah, they entered the game ranked number three in the country in run defense. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't really the running game that beat them. It was Florida's ability to throw over the top. Right. Yeah, those those big completions uh, were definitely – they were killers. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure where we go from here. <laughs> well, you know, we talked about this uh, last week when we talked about, you know, they lose at South Carolina – or they lose to South Carolina at home, play Georgia tough, then they get that big win at Ole Miss – and now suddenly, you know, you feel like the season is manageable. Well, now you've got yourself in a situation, and Mark Stoops said that his team has to play perfect because they're they're a little dinged up and, and they have some injuries. But now you're in a situation where, okay, you, you have to win this week against a bad Auburn team because you know you're probably not going to win at Tennessee and you're probably not going to win at Texas. And to become bowl eligible, you have to win those remaining home games against Auburn, Murray State, and Louisville. Against an Auburn team that's never lost in Lexington. Yeah. So. But they're a bad Auburn team. Yeah. We, uh, Two and five. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, the, the only team uh, below, the only teams below Kentucky are Auburn and Mississippi State, which hasn't won a conference game yet. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, I, Again, I just don't know what the answer is. We we don't get the kind of quarterback play that I feel like we should be getting, uh, and that's you know it's a little late to worry about. Well, that. and and you know we've discussed that. You know, Brock Vandegrift, what's going on around him with the offensive line and 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 some other things. You know, it he. And as a first year starter, I think he's progressed about where maybe you think he would be. I, I, I don't know, but um, you know, there, there is some questioning. The fans are questioning the play calling. Um, Mark Stoops is an old school football coach. He wants to ground and pound. He wants to run the ball. And, you know, he knows that with modern football, you have to have tempo and you, you have to throw the ball. So, Well, and, and talking to the fact of needing to run the football, we've got Wilcox, who well, – That was another thing. Who is – you know, gets the ball. He gets three touches and he averages 11 yards a touch and then that's it. And, and yeah, he you gets know, two weeks ago kind of made the joke that, you know, he didn't keep his shoes tied. And, and the shoe point, literally fell off against Florida. It, it, yeah, the shoe did fall off during Florida. So yeah. I'm, you know, to me that I'm no football coach, but you've got an athletic trainer over there, tape his shoes on and get the kid in the Well, game. there's, a, there's a, a relationship with Nike and you can't, as I used to call it, spat the shoes, which would be tape your shoes up because the, the Nike swoosh has to be visible. But that's... You know, that's politics. We have a sharpie. But, but either way, I mean, I, it was horrifying to see that shoe come off against Florida just days after Mark Stoops was complaining that, you know, if he wants more playing time, he's got to be able to keep his shoe on. But to your point, you know, he gets a couple of touches early in the game. And one carry goes for 25 yards, and then he gets one more touch the rest of the game. Yeah. You know, and then you've got Chip Trainum, who they've been trying to get back in. Uh, you know, for his very first game. And he gets in against Florida, he has seven carries. So you're taken away from what Wilcox can do. But, uh, you know, by that point, this team is not built to come back in a hurry. Um, and at that point, you know, Kentucky's behind and and you got to throw the ball. So yeah, pick your poison. Yeah, I mean, it just we, – we've definitely – these last couple seasons, really, we've just hit kind of a plateau. And while we're plateauing – You've got all these other schools in the SEC and and college football in general just up in their game. I mean, you got Vandy playing excellent football right now. Indiana ranked. What in the Both world? of them ranked for the first time since 37. Right. Uh, Nuts. Yeah, you know, Georgia goes down and, and puts it on Texas. It, it, there's just yeah. any week. This league is really, really good. So let's let's hear from Stoops because he talks about he he was asked about the play calling, and um, you know he says that unless they ask him, you know he he tries to stay out of the mix. 
you know, we have to finish plays, you know, finish drives. I think once again, you know, it, it, as I mentioned, it's not quite as magnified if we have what with, with the opportunities that we have if we get them in the end zone. You know, when, uh, you know, there, there's no, no excuse for not getting in on third and short and fourth and short. You know, we got to get the ball in the end zone. We're close and, you know, we got to finish drives a little bit better and, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to score more. What is the balance in those short yardage situations? Like, obviously, you don't want to risk a bad play. The obvious thing is just line it up and run it, but it wasn't working, and then you hit the one pass. How do you balance well, the pass in the open field, it's a little different. You have a little more room. You know, in the in the in the one yard line, you know, the, sure, there's a balance there. Later, we had it uh, from the three, and we we're going to throw the ball and. And that, that's really the only time I know everybody thinks I'm not opening myself up here for uh, the, the criticism. Uh, criticism is fair, but, you know, I don't get involved in play calling. And, um, but they did ask me on, on the one, on the three, when we had a person go on the three, and, and I, I, I absolutely said pound it, like pound the rock. And we did. And we scored. You know what I mean? Like, let's not get cute now. We can be physical. We could run it in here. I told them they had four downs because it was first and goal. So I said, let's not outthink this. You know, on the others, I didn't say a word. You know what I mean? I said, you know, play what you, you know, call what you want to call. I thought he made a great call on the fourth and two. You know, when, when, we, were, when we were discussing it, I said, you know, I told him to go for it. And he's, I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to throw it. I said, do it. Yeah, definitely uh, some interesting comments there from, from Mark. Um, I'm when you've had the number of offensive coordinators <laughs> that you've had, that kind of makes me question whether or not you really stay out of the play calling. Uh, he might not officially call the plays, but I just have to wonder if he can veto plays. Yeah, I think they have like a big waffle house looking menu <laughs> that says in this situation, you can run scattered this situation. You can run smothered, but you cannot scatter smothered. It's a good analogy. In, the same place. I'm sure Waffle don't... House is happy to hear you yeah, use that analogy. I just don't think the I don't think we're getting the full story here. But you know, who knows? Well, and and one th shout out to Stoops. He he lost his mother this morning. We're recording this on Wednesday, the the 23rd. Um, and I, I his mother Evelyn has been to many many games in Lexington. You know, I see her in the press conferences. Um, I haven't seen her this year, and she's probably been ill. But uh, she's the matriarch of the Stoops family, full of football coaches, because you've got Mike, who's the linebackers coach here, Mark's brother. And then you've got Bob, who obviously had great success at Oklahoma. And then you have Ron Jr., uh, who was also a college coach. And speaking of uh, condolences, I want to send out my condolences to the family of Lonnie Demery, who – Longtime member of the media, uh, we called him the mayor of UK football because he was such a fan, and he, a self-proclaimed super fan. Um, Lonnie took a bad step last year, and I don't remember which which game it was, but it was at the stadium. He took a bad step and took a fall, and he never really recovered and uh, passed away this week. and And uh, we're really sorry about hearing that. And uh, our condolences go out to Lonnie and his wife, Maggie. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's always tough to lose somebody who's who's seen as much Kentucky football and Kentucky sports yeah, in general. Seen a lot uh, of Kentucky football uh, and a lot of bad Kentucky yeah. football. Yeah, so uh, that, that's that's a tough one for sure. But uh, so uh, switching gears a little bit, we'll talk uh, briefly. Uh, the NBA season kicked off last night, uh, and we got to see uh, – History long awaited uh, by some accounts. Long awaited. <laughs> LeBron James and his son Bronny. Uh, well, he's probably been pointing to this for four years since, uh, or however long Bronny was in in college. You know, since since Bronny's high school days. You know, Bronny played in an AAU event here in Lexington. Uh, I believe when he was either nine or ten, and LeBron was there. And um, you know. Those two have been tight for a while. Obviously, they're father and son, but uh, I think they've been pointing to this day for a long time. And, um, you know, we've seen it with Ken Griffey and Ken Griffey Jr., and they were at the game last night, the Lakers game. 
Uh, we saw Roger Clemens here in Lexington play with his kid on a rehab assignment with the Lexington Legends. So it's kind of cool to see. I, uh, I'm not sure that, that Bronny will stay on that team very long. Right. I mean, I mean, come on. He's We're, not an NBA player. Yeah, he's not an NBA basketball player. And it pays to have a dad who is a superstar and one of, you know, arguably – five or ten greatest players to ever play the game right and we'll talk about that uh later in a later episode we'll we'll debate where lebron stands uh in in the pantheon of all-time greats uh i personally i don't have him at the top no surprise uh, i think michael's probably number one yeah, we're of the generation that you know we 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 saw michael and i didn't see jerry west so that you know i would love he's the logo yeah. so so uh, you know so LeBron and Bronny, we'll see how that plays out. I know that he got his three minutes in and his mama got up and left as soon as that was over. And- I saw the highlights and, and LeBron kept feeding him and he just could not make an outside shot. And if you can't make shots in that league, you're not going to be there very long. All right. And of course we got, you know, former cats to keep an eye on. Um, I think uh, tonight actually Reed Shepard and the Rockets, they, uh, they play their first game tonight. Last night we had, uh, we had Carl Anthony Towns. Uh, He's with the Knicks now. The Knicks, uh, Traded for Julius Randle. Yeah, and, you know, Carl Anthony had, uh, I think, 12 points. He, he didn't have a great game. Yeah. Uh, 12 points, seven boards. Uh, but he only, but took, he only took nine shots. Um, he's, he can be efficient like that. <clears throat> he's home. Uh, you know, he's from across the river in Jersey, so – I think that's probably a really good move. Ever since he lost his mother during COVID, I think, uh, you know, that affected him. So it's it's probably a really good thing that he and Carl Sr. are, are back home in that, you know, in that environment, uh, that comfort zone. And he probably loves playing at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, I'm sure he does. I mean, on the flip side of that Lakers game, of course, they were playing the Timberwolves, and that's where uh... – that's where Julius, Julius ended up uh, in that in that trade. Uh, he went for sixteen and nine. Uh, of course, Anthony Edwards was the man for the the Timberwolves. Uh, he's he and Anthony him Davis. Him. And Davis were woofing it at the end. Yeah, Anthony Davis had a had a great game last night: thirty six points and sixteen boards. He'll be hurt two weeks. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> he's he's great he when he's healthy. he's great when he's on the floor. But man. um, you got to get that load management. Uh, taken care of so if you have to fake an injury i guess to get you know get there then then that's what you do uh of course the the celtics and jason tatum he went crazy last night 37 points 10 assists guy who didn't play what but a couple of minutes in the olympics yeah that's still that's load mind management for you yeah yeah kind of mind-boggling but uh but yeah so the uh 29 kentucky players on nba opening day rosters Six of those guys are on a two-way contract, so they may or may not be there, you know, soon. But 29 guys that, that wore the blue and white, including Reed Shepard and, and Rob Dillingham, who came off the bench, I don't think anybody's ever going to let Cal live that down. Yeah. Um, Reed Shepard and, and Dalton Connect from Tennessee, probably the two favorites for Rookie of the Year. I got Reed at, at plus 650, so, uh, you know, that would be a nice payoff if, if that were to happen. But I hope selfishly um, that, that Reed plays well and, and wins that award. That would just be something because the kid played at North Laurel two years ago. Right. That's just staggering. And, and people were wondering, you know, could he play? Well, I was, ab- I was about to – yeah. They were, when, he, when he – and it was almost as if Cal reluctantly took him, you know, kind of like the Richie Farmer deal where – you kind of cave into to fan pressure or whatever, but you know, I think Reed bailed him out and, and showed him that he could play, but I don't, I can't ever remember a more meteoric rise of a Kentucky player than Reed Shepard coming in, you know, a guy from, and I, I consider London, the mountains coming in from the mountains and, and having some stuff to prove. And like we said, was he going to be able to play? Where were the minutes going to come from? And it was like you knew early on from that Kansas game, he had to be on the floor. He had to be on the floor, and, right? And then he wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, a little frustrating. But we'll uh, we'll we'll keep an eye on those those former cats for sure uh, in the NBA. Uh, other sports topic 
we're going to touch on, of course, we got the World Series starting uh, Friday. Friday night. Uh, first World Series appearance for the Yankees in 15 years. Uh, of course, the Dodgers just won it four years ago. And this is the 12th meeting between L.A. and the Yankees in World Series history. They haven't met since 81, which was the year of Fernando, Fernando Mania. Mania, who passed away today. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget that year because, you know, he started out as a, as a rookie, he was eight. zero at one point in the, in the season. And he had a, uh, a 0. 0.50 ERA. It was just nuts. Yeah. And I'll always forget, you know, in that windup, he would always take a peek at the heavens before delivering it to the plate and a uh, pudgy guy. And everybody was like, uh, who is this dude? And, you know, yeah. Fernando was a, was a Dodger. Great. Yeah, 17 years, and up until just last year, he had been uh, the Dodgers, uh, like, uh, foreign language broadcaster. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, you know, it'll be interesting, you know, to see they haven't, you know, I don't know if he was sick. I don't know if that's what led him to to step down when he did last year, but um, I'm sure more will come out on that. But but this, this World Series is going to be, you know, it's going to be fun to watch. Of course, you got – two of the greatest home run hitters of the game right now and Aaron judge and Shohei Otani, uh, which just, he just defies logic. For yeah. me, I don't, I don't remember the unicorn. That. And I, I'll rem- I remember when, when LA signed him and he was coming over here from the Japanese leagues, uh, and everybody described him as a unitor, a unicorn a guy who was a pitcher and, and an equal as a hitter. And he's not even pitching this year. Yeah. And he's already, you know, a 50-50 guy. It's just kind of amazing. First of all, he's, you know, he's not, he, he doesn't speak the language very well. Uh, there's, so you've got the language barrier and, and you know, he's playing in L.A., he's playing in a fishbowl, and he's just thrived. Yeah. I mean, he, the That's kid, crazy. you know, he's, you know, I'm not a necessarily. I wouldn't call myself a baseball fan. I don't. I don't watch a ton of baseball. But if I'm channel surfing and they they've been playing this season, yeah, he's must see. I TV. will stop and watch because yeah. there's a good possibility that you're gonna that you're gonna see him uh, do something spectacular. And and uh, like a lot of people, uh, I'll be watching uh, mainly because I saw that the average ticket price currently for the World Series is running at right at fifteen hundred dollars wow. for a single ticket. So it's New York dollars. Yeah, that's uh that's the common man like me and And you've got a handful of guy a handful of guys on that Dodger team with Kentucky connections. You know, you've got Walker Bueller who'll get a start somewhere in the series. He's the Henry Clay guy, played at Vandy. Uh you've got Kiki Hernandez who the third baseman who played for the Legends. You've got uh T Oscar Hernandez, the starting center fielder who played for the legends and then uh battery mate of Bueller would be Wal- uh, Will Smith who who grew up in Louisville played at Kentucky Country Day and then for U of L so kind of a cool situation there too you've got some rooting interest you know especially when Walker Bueller takes the mound coming off of his second Tommy John surgery which is just crazy to think too uh this this kid is just I think he just turned 30 um but he's going to be signing a massive contract here in the next year or so yeah good for him it's it's yeah. always and fun to win, likely to win a second ring right it's it's cool to see uh the all the kentucky kids no matter the sport that's that's fun it, and that gets me watching things that i might not normally watch right. so that's pretty cool so we'll have a lot of a lot of sports to talk about uh over the next week or so we'll shift gears and uh talk about some music and i i like to combine the two because I don't watch sports on television anymore with the volume turned up. I've noticed. I I'm spinning vinyl when I uh, when I watch sports. Um, that's my preferred method these days. Steve and I both are are back into vinyl after many many years of not uh, collecting, and uh, we've talked about this. It's it's nostalgia for us. Um, it has. I don't know, speaking for myself, it has caused me to listen to uh, different genres of music that I wouldn't have listened to even four years ago, um, mainly because if I find you know something at a peddler's mall or a flea market that's cheap and 
the cover's in good condition. I just, yep. you know, I'll, I'll drop a couple dollars on something and it's turned out to be a pretty good deal on my part. Do you, what, what's your motivation for buying? Do you buy, do you buy because you, you might be investing, uh, not an emotional investment. I'm talking about a financial investment. Do you, do you buy for an emotional investment or, or, you know, is it curiosity? I mean, cause I know like, you know, my, uh, my bailiwick would be, you know, modern or not modern, but classic rock. Um, some of that stuff. Uh, you know, I know I, I look for that kind of thing and, and I enjoy the music. Um, I don't buy it all because I'm investing thinking, Oh, I'm going to get a good return on my money. That's right. just silly. Um, but it's an emotional investment. Yeah, I definitely don't uh, buy albums because of because I think they're going to be worth something down down the road. I don't do that at all. A true, like I consider myself a music enthusiast as opposed to an audio. Yeah, I'm not an audiophile and I'm not a collector. I read an article uh, that said it was just this ridiculous percentage. It was like thirty or forty percent of the people buying up all these Taylor Swift albums didn't even have a record player to play them on. You have a Taylor Swift album. I do not be honest. have a Taylor Swift album. Um, I've, no, I've got, nor do I. I've got a lot of stuff in my collection that my kids have turned me on to, but so far they've not, uh, I've not purchased a Taylor Swift album. Probably won't. Uh, but <laughs> I don't think but, many uh, our age or, or but I do with I our mean, likes will. You know, I, they've, they've gotten me onto some stuff. I, I, they bought me a Lizzo album. And because I had told him, I was like, I don't mind Lizzo. That's fine. But if you want me to listen to it on my record player, you're going to have to buy it for me. And so they did. They bought it for me for Christmas. Or something. And I'm sure it sounds great. It, it sounds amazing. And yeah. and that's that's kind of my, you know, that's my MO when I'm listening down here. Um, I've got a neat little app on my phone. I've got all my collection cataloged on my phone. And it's called Discogs. It's called Discogs if you're a vinyl collector. And do Get the app. Whatever. Put, put your collection on the app and but what you can do is kind of like spinning the wheel you can hit a random uh item and it will select something out of your collection so you put it on the table and so i just pull it out so that means i may listen to lizzo then i may listen to metallica it's then i might nice. listen to flatten scruggs <laughs> you know you just you don't know what's gonna what's gonna pop up next but um so we'll, we'll, we'll be discussing recent purchases. And I mean, and my big thing, uh, I'm, I'm getting Steve there to listen to, uh, listen to some Billy strings. And, uh, you, if you've paid attention to any music whatsoever in the last couple of years, you've probably at least heard his name and you probably are like, Oh yeah, he's that bluegrass guitar player. And that's just such a disservice to what the kid is capable of. Not when he's playing with Tool and Primus. Right. He, he, he will get on stage and jam with anybody. Uh, but he just, uh, he's actually dropped two different albums this year. He put out a double live album. And then uh, just a few weeks ago, dropped a new uh, studio album called Highway Prayers. And that one's just kind of interesting because uh, it's currently number one on the Billboard top album sales chart. Uh, which made it the first bluegrass album to do that since 2002's Oh Brother, Where Art Thou soundtrack um, with George Clooney, George and, Clooney movie. Mm -hmm. and, and Union Station doing the bulk of the, the heavy lifting on that album. Um, so it's cool to have that bluegrass, you know, kind of idea getting pushed out there. But uh, it's also number eight on the top country album chart. And so that means he's going up against all the bro country guys and, and doing well. Uh, so Jelly roll. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. And, and then I, I saw that uh, Billy is also featured on three songs on the new country album that's coming out from Ringo Starr. Yeah. 84 year old Ringo Starr. He decided to do a country album and uh, they're all doing country. Well, and, and we've, we've discussed Beyonce. this. Again, no. Uh, Beyonce <laughs> released a country album, uh, but it's. I mean, Dolly's doing rock. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I I would hazard a guess to say that Dolly was closer to a rock album than Beyonce was a country album. Uh, but but I did listen to the the only track they've released so far uh, from Ringo's album, which is produced and co-written by T Bone Burnett. So there's some chops there, uh, for sure as if Ringo doesn't have enough right. on his own, but, 
the, the first song um, is called Time on My Hands. And it's, it's not a bro country song like, like Post Malone filled his country album up with. It's, it's a really good song. It's, um, it's got a little bit of a Dwight Yoakam sort of construct, I think. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic. Also, because of the fact that he brought on Billy Strings, he brought on Allison Krauss, he brought on Molly Tuttle. Uh, so he surrounded himself with some, you know, heavy hitters from from true country and bluegrass uh, genres. So it'll be interesting to see where that album goes uh, when it when it comes out. But uh, in addition to vinyl, we do a lot of live shows. Uh, we try to do some together. And mm-hmm. Uh, we've got one at least on the docket. It's a couple months down the road. Just threw some cabbage down on Billy Gibbons, the ZZ Top guitar player, a great guitar player. Um, I didn't know he did um, solo stuff, but I should have. But, yeah, he's going to make an appearance at uh, the Kentucky Theater in Lexington in February, I think. Yeah, I think it's in February. And, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. I, I like ZZ Top. I've seen them a couple of times, and obviously they're fun. Yeah. Uh, this might be a chance for us to see like him really show us his his guitar chops. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And and the Kentucky's a fun place to see shows. Yeah. Um, they've you know over the years, uh, my my best show I saw at the Kentucky was uh, Hootie and the Blowfish. Oh my god. Uh, 2000 eight or nine something like that yeah wow. pretty pretty awesome show though uh so I, I can't complain there fresh off the strand in south carolina yeah, yeah they were they've been around a little bit but uh it was before darius decided he was going to sing country country um so anyway, yeah. when in doubt country <laughs> so yeah we're, we're gonna see some shows um you know i've seen some good ones in the last few months um i took in the three and a half hour epic performance by Sturgill Simpson at Rep Arena yeah. uh, a, a month or so ago that was just just mind-blowing um, there were times where he just got into a, a rhythm and a jam and and would turn and face the drummer I think he just kind of forgot there were 16, people there people mm-hmm. there to hear him sing and play and and he was just kind of lost in, in his own world so uh, another you know local guy Kentucky guy coming back and, and making waves and and he's kind of been all over the place the last few years he, he kind of took a break from singing because he had a vocal cord injury but uh showed up in some episodes of uh of uh the righteous gemstones and uh you know was doing a little acting that kind of thing so it was a wild and crazy yeah, show yeah, just, yeah that uh it's kind of ridiculous in its premise but then you're kind of like wonder how close to reality that is uh, we, we, yeah. won't go, we won't go down that road but, uh, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if those families are as dysfunctional but yeah it's uh it's a good show that's, that's that's one of the better shows i've watched in the last few years so yeah lots of music uh what about food had any good food lately no uh like you know where i'm going with this <laughs> so i took in jack-o'-lantern spectacular which if you have not seen it, I'll put some pictures up here. If you haven't seen it, it's at Iroquois Park in Louisville. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, they they advertise like 5,000 pumpkins that are carved. And the carvings are just, I mean, they're art. They really are. It's like art. Um, and they're, this year it was it was more of a trivia contest. When you walk in, the first thing you see are like pumpkins with a theme of jack. So immediately you see uh, Jack Nicholson in his infamous scene from The Shining where he bursts through the door. Right. Here's Johnny. And then, uh, you know, you see Jack White, the guitar player from The White Stripes. And then there's some others. But, I mean, it's just, um, it's, it's, just it's just an amazing thing. I highly recommend it. So after Jack O'Lantern, spectacular we went to the highlands and ate at a place called uh ramey's cafe on the world and i think maybe they were trying to do a little too much i mean no kidding there was something on the menu from almost every culture imaginable you know there was mexican and there was indian and there was you know chinese and i ended up getting 
uh, whitefish with uh, crab cakes. Crab cakes were awesome. Whitefish, not so much. <laughs> and the price was pretty crazy. Yeah, that's for, that's for unfortunate. The, you know, I, I'm I taking pictures. Didn't deserve it. I'm the type of person who I don't mind paying a little bit more uh, for a meal if it's right. going to be good. You know, I, I won't be disappointed. So I, I, I've gotten to the point where I, I kind of stick to what I know. I, I still love to try different stuff. But so like this past weekend, um, Friday night, I ended up, I was flying solo that night. So I ended up at Smithtown Seafood over at West Six Brewing, which is, you know, one of the best places in town to get one of my favorite dishes, which is just good old fish and chips uh and and also drink one of my favorite beverages from them that they do seasonally this is uh is that named after the castlewood park yes it is um and this is their castlewood black ipa uh which you know black ipa basically takes all the things that i like which are the hop it's the hoppy bitterness of a normal ipa and then adds on the back end the roastiness uh just using darker malts and that kind of thing so kind of gets the best of both worlds for me it's roasty and it's bitter uh so i'll uh i'll probably be drinking something most every time we're recording one of these and I, i'm going to try to mix it up and and make it something different uh try to do some new stuff or at least hit some old favorites uh but definitely uh, local breweries uh, we've got some good ones we don't have as many local breweries as some cities our size or even smaller but the ones we have all make quality products so uh, i try to keep spend as many of my dollars locally as i can and we're in georgetown so we're partial to country boy yeah we we we, uh we visit there quite a bit so uh, and underrated food too by the way yeah yeah i mean and you know we don't have a ton of great options here in georgetown as far as food i mean if you if you want something outside of a chain um you're really limited in georgetown so it is kind of nice to to get out to country boy and uh big steve out there working the uh, smoker you always know it's going to be really good so uh highly recommend getting out there if you haven't done that kid and family friendly uh, yeah, they just don't just because it's a brewery that you right. take your kids there and that that goes you know, you can go say that about everybody in, in the area. So that's good. Uh, the other good food I had this weekend was um, we went up to Cincinnati on Saturday, my wife and I, for the Blink exhibit, which um, I found it a couple of years ago, kind of forgot about it. And then it popped back up in my Facebook feed a week or so ago. But it is a, for lack of a better explanation, I guess it's an art uh, focused installation and exhibit where Cincinnati, which is known for their murals anyway on their buildings, they got some amazing murals. Well, they incorporate those as part of the tour, but uh, it starts in Newport and Covington and works its way up so over you're, 30 blocks. You're actually walking with the art on the buildings. Yes. You it you can't somebody like narrating. No, you, you you don't you don't drive because they shut down a lot of the streets and it it goes all the way up to Findlay Market, which is you know north of downtown. Uh, but you can't see it all in one night. Um, you've got murals scattered around, which obviously are better viewed during the daylight hours. But then as as the sun sets, you start getting all these light based uh, art installations. Laser lasers uh projections they cool. do a lot of projections on the side of buildings and the really cool ones incorporated buildings that had murals and then the projections worked with the architecture so they would have lights that would and and we'll we'll drop a couple still yeah. shots uh, in pictures here up right now kind of show uh what we were seeing but it was cool most of them were set to music they had projectors and you know big speaker systems set up so that you got the full experience uh so anyway we we spent the evening walking around doing that but there was no shortage of great food trucks and things and uh we settled on uh we had a couple of different things that we shared but the one that uh that i'll talk about was called mama bear's mac and they are a gourmet uh, grilled cheese and macaroni uh that's cool cheese uh, truck stopped up for a week yeah yeah <laughs> it's uh it was pretty amazing i had the uh, smoky bear mac which took just a pretty awesome mac and cheese topped it with some pulled pork 
pickled onions, and then a bunch of crushed up Grippos potato chips. And so I like you, Grippos. You had me right there with the Grippos. Yep. Um, like I said, if if you uh, have a favorite barbecue potato chip that is not Grippos, then you're incorrect. Um, you, need to, <laughs> you need to work on that a little bit. Uh, Grippos are amazingly, they're just awesome. Uh, the inconsistency, like I said, is you can get a bag that's you know mellow barbecue, or you can get one that'll melt your face off hot. So that's that's what I like because you never know what you're going to get with a bag of Grippos. But those people, they did a great job with it. Uh, but I would highly recommend. I think they have a a like permanent type location. I think it's at Grainworks Brewing, which is, oh, I think I got the name of that right, Grainworks up in Westchester, Ohio. So, uh, and it looked like they had a few other things on their menu there. I think you could do a burger and that kind of That's thing. That's cool. So, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely be doing some some good food. Uh, I've got one kid celebrating a birthday this weekend, so uh, we're taking her out for the requisite steak dinner that she usually requests. So, uh, and but. Uh, thankfully i guess she she doesn't necessarily want to go to the you know the jeff rubies of the world so well, maybe you can find something she's you can share of, with her well, right? she's a fan of jay alexander so i love jay alexander that's where we're gonna go is jay alexander's they're, uh, they're they great. have the best mac and cheese their mac and cheese is it very is good fabulous. i'll give you that i will give you that for sure i'm but just yeah. peeking around you here yeah, uh, update okay. kentucky is annihilating kentucky wesleyan Kentucky scored a hundred points with six and a half minutes to go in the game. Both Kentucky kids are on the floor and I've seen at least four back four buckets between the two of them. So, um, I mean, I know they're playing Wesley and no disrespect, but if they keep shooting the ball the way they are, I think Kentucky fans are, are going to be happy. It's going to be, it's going to be exciting. Be a lot of threes in the air. Yeah. I think I heard one of the players say that their goal is 35 a game. Yeah. Yeah. They shot, uh, I've already forgotten what we said. They shot 20 in the first half, uh, connected on eight of those. So 40% to interrupt your food. Yeah, we'll train. take that. Oh yeah. No worries. I think we're, I think we're done there anyway, but, uh, yeah. So I don't know if we've got anything else today or not. But... Well, I wanted to ask you about Walgreens. Oh yeah. We got a little bit of time here. I wanted to ask you about Walgreens because you are the pharmacist and, and I mean, this economy, the way it is right now, uh, and the, and what COVID did to some businesses. I mean, what are your thoughts on on a on a on a big chain like Walgreens? You know, shuttering most of its stores. When Walgreens decided to put so many stores out there, and you finally get to a point where the pharmacists are tired of filling more and more prescriptions with less and less help, then the revolt begins. And so Walgreens can say they're closing underperforming stores, uh, but they are closing underperforming stores because they're having to maybe only open them one, two, three days a week because they literally do not have the staff to open the store. So legally, it has to be a pharmacist present to open the doors. Um, if you don't have pharmacists willing to work for you, uh, you're going to have to close some stores. And that's, that's kind of what's happening. There, there's a, there's a little bit of a revolution going on in, in the pharmacy world right now. And pharmacists are finally uh, saying we've had enough and you know, I'm glad I had enough and got right. out of regional pharmacy. Yeah, you're so, compounding uh, now you're making drugs. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely a, a switch for an old guy like me to, to, do such a 180 and and do things that i literally haven't done since pharmacy school. well it's kind of like weather in our business weather affects everybody so he's the most popular or she's the most popular person on tv uh in terms of eyeballs and i can't think of something else other than like a doctor or a pharmacy that affects most people every day there's a lot of cars in a line waiting to get their prescriptions filled. I know that. Yeah. And it, you know, and, and I know most of the time you're limited on where you can have your prescriptions filled because of your insurance. They tell you where you have to go, but, uh, but my goodness, if you have the ability to support a local uh, pharmacist, please do so because there's a, there's a level of care and concern there that I think, you know, not to say not to knock my friends who are 
who are retail pharmacists in the big chains because I was one. Um, but it's tough to be as caring and as concerned as you need to be when you've got corporate breathing down your neck. Yeah. To, it's all about metrics. Well, and it's, you know, the, the fast food industry, the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, all of them are going through a, um, a change too. You know, they're, they're becoming more of a drive through based uh, establishment because m- less people are, are going inside to eat and more people are hitting the drive through because we're all busy. Yeah. So I can see it. Yeah, definitely. So we, uh, Trent Noah just hit another three. Um, if they shoot the ball well, Steve doesn't want to admit it. This team's going to win a national it's gonna championship. Be hard. It's going to be hard for these guys. Although this is the oldest team in Kentucky history, you know, we get, we grew tired of hearing Cal talk about we're the youngest team in America, you know, and we know every year he was because he had 10 new players. Right. And that was just kind of a, you know, that was his MO. He wanted, uh, you know, the one and done, so that's fine. Yeah. And now this he year we've the, got the first, you know, I, I'll give this, I'll say this for Cal in terms of being able to outthink the room, the guy was always one step ahead of everyone until Shashevsky started recruiting the one and dones and then the, the, the playing field leveled. Yeah, for sure. And this team, you know, like to Steve's point, um, seven, I think it's seven or eight guys on the team are in their fourth or fifth year of college yeah. basketball. So yeah, we won't be able to use, I mean, yeah, they're all new. They're all new to us, but they're not new to college basketball. And, and granted you've got guys coming from, Fairly Dickinson and uh, parts unknown, Dayton. but, but uh, hopefully that experience, I mean, as well, evident by the teams that have beaten Kentucky in the tournament the last few years. That's right. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, the whole thing has started skewing uh, older and older, you know, over the last three or four years, Kentucky hasn't made it out of the first round of the NCAA tournament. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch. I, I will say there's one thing tangible that I've noticed just in being over uh, at at UK in the basketball offices over there in the gyms is there is a tangible difference in attitude. Everybody over there has a little pep in their step. They're they're a little more happy. They're a little more eager to deal with you as media, and I think a lot of that is just because you know it had become just a burden dealing with John Calipari on a daily basis over there. Yeah. Yeah. So and I hate to say that because on a personal level, John Calipari was very good to me. Took me to the Dominican Republic when he was named the Dominican national coach. Um, I helped produce his coach, coach a show for six or seven years. So, I mean, I kind of had a personal relationship with him, albeit, you know, very um, business like relationship, but, you know, it was time. Yeah. And I think we're, I hate to say this too. I think we're heading that direction with Mark Stoops. Yeah. And there's 44 million reasons that uh, we, I don't know if we're going to get lucky and uh, have a golden parachute. <laughs> Is Arkansas, are they ready to hire a new football coach? Not yet. Okay. All right. Not yet. Well, well I think, I think Mark, I, I think Mark is smart enough that he will leave, a, you know, on his own. And if, if that's the direction he goes, um, I could see him leaving for Florida State because they're going to fire Mike Norvell. Yeah. Uh, I could also see him going to Iowa, although I don't know how you recruit to Iowa. I yeah. really don't. But Kirk Ferentz is probably pretty close to retirement. Um, you know, they forced him to change their off- their offensive coordinator, who was his son. You know, that was hard. So. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts. I mean, I, I would like nothing better than to see Stoops, you know, turn it around and have a second, you know, second coming of sorts, uh, at Kentucky, but that remains to be seen. Uh, 123 started. points. The Wildcats have scored tonight. Yeah. We're down to 10 seconds. Playing Kentucky so, West. so let's, uh, let's not get too excited, I guess, but we'll, Keep it all it'll, check. we'll get real here in a couple of weeks when right. we go visit Mr. Cooper flag and the Duke blue devils. Um, that kid's the Early real test. deal. Yeah. He uh, is a, generational player we've we've talked about it before he's as much as i hate to admit it um he's Mm -hmm. i'll be able to cheer for him next season 123 52 is a final score 
So a good start to the Mark Pope era at Kentucky. And I'm going to bet you that if you listen to the call-in shows tonight, it's going to be a love fest. Yeah. We're winning the national championship. Yeah. Like, I'm not going there. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to call it a night. And uh, next week, hopefully we'll be able to talk about a big win over Auburn. We'll be able to talk about uh, shooting 43s against another overmatched exhibition opponent. And, uh, and we'll have some uh, World Series results to, to discuss as well. And probably some new vinyl purchases. And uh, so, all right. Hope so, anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, hope everybody uh, enjoyed uh, our little corner of the world tonight. And uh, hope you see us uh, again next week. 